One man, feeling spurned by society, decided to plan and carry out an attack on innocent people in a large scope within the crowded streets of Akihabara in Tokyo. While he knew very well what he was going to do in his plan, he couldn't have expected the chaos and the fallout that would come after. Time and time again, we see stories with similar bullet points. For example, here we have a young man, isolated, feeling neglected by society. Usually they have mental health issues, a terrible upbringing, a toxic community around them, or all three in this case. Let's look into the background and the after effects, not to mention the attack itself, of what has been called the Akihabara Massacre. Tomohiro Kato was born into a wealthy family that lived in a nice suburban home in Aomori in 1982. His father was doing well for himself, being a top manager in a financial institution. His mother was a housewife, staying home and looking after both Tomohiro and, after not too long, his younger brother as well. Tomohiro's early life was the ideal sort of childhood that one would wish for. His family was wealthy, he had a good relationship with his parents, and he was doing exceptionally well in elementary school. He had good friends and was one of the top track and field athletes in the school by the time he was about 10 years old. When it was time to enter into middle school, he traded out track and field for the tennis club, still doing fairly well in school. However, this was when his home life took a turn and things started to deteriorate. Both of his parents, but mainly his mother, were putting an immense amount of pressure on Tomohiro and his younger brother to succeed. They were expected to be both top athletes in their schools and get top grades in their classes. Tomohiro's mother would often have him redo his homework over and over and over again until she was satisfied that it would likely impress his teachers. If she felt that even one letter on the paper looked wrong, she wouldn't let him use an eraser. She would crumple up the entire paper and have him start over again from the beginning. Needless to say, she was strict. Tomohiro's mother got more and more abusive over time. When he was about 13 years old, the family was eating dinner together one night when his mother got more upset with him than usual. She gathered up some newspapers, threw them down in the hallway, and poured his rice, soup, and the rest of his food all over them, ordering him to eat it all there like a dog. Tomohiro's father remained silent and emotionless as he ate his food from the hallway floor while crying. The harsh treatment continued to snowball until Tomohiro was forced to stand outside all night in the freezing temperatures as punishment for minor offenses, usually related to studying. This all had the exact opposite effect that his mother had hoped for and his grades began to suffer. Tomohiro felt that his mother had abandoned him in favor of his younger brother who was still doing fairly well back in elementary school. He later wrote, By the time I was in junior high, my parents were no longer strong enough and they dumped me. However, things could still get worse, and they did. My life went well until I entered high school, he wrote. After that, it did not go as I wanted. While Tomohiro's grades had suffered a bit, they were still high enough on average to enter into the most academically prestigious high school in the entire prefecture, Aomori High School. He hit his first and perhaps his biggest roadblock when he got a terrible score on his first exam at this new school. He was hit with the reality that he may be in over his head upon seeing how difficult this school would really be. While he may have been a star student at his previous school, that sadly was not the reality here. If anything, he was just average, if even that. One of his high school friends has been quoted as saying, He told me that he was so shocked that he began to hate studying. While one of his teachers has said, He wasn't outstanding in studies or extracurricular activities at all. He was really a mediocre student. In competition with the brighter students at his high school and suffering from quite the blow to his motivation, Tomohiro's grades began to plummet. Because of this, he felt like he really was losing his mother for good. All she really seemed to care about was his success, and he wasn't getting it. Whether it was true or just inside of his head, he felt that his mother was slowly losing interest in him and abandoning him in favor of his more successful younger brother. Eventually, both Tomohiro and his younger brother started to turn on their mother. After taking her abuse for so long, they were now big enough to turn the tables on her. A neighbor of theirs has said that she would hear them from time to time beating on their mother. 
This same neighbor was told by the mother that it was now painful to sit at the dinner table together with them. This increasingly hostile and violent home life didn't do anything to improve his school life by any means. His academic ranking fell to number 300 of 360 students. While he had originally planned to go to Hokkaido University, fairly far off from the rest of his family, he couldn't pass the entrance exams. Instead, he entered into a junior college while he decided what he wanted to do in the future. In his second year, he expressed an interest to enter into Hirosaki University in Aomori to study education and eventually become a middle school teacher. After all, that was the best time of his life, the last time he was really happy. He wanted to go back, even if it were in a different role. However, the examination period to get into that school had already passed. He was too late. Tomohiro decided to give up on academics entirely and focus on another interest, motorsports. He decided he would become a mechanic, enrolling at Nakanihon Automotive College. However, all motivation was basically gone by this point. He skipped classes more often than not, failing to get his mechanic's license in the end. Tomohiro Kato went to hop from job to job for his entire young adult life, doing whatever he could to get by, usually never staying at one job for more than a few months. He worked at a security company in Sendai and transportation companies in Aomori and Ibaraki. He couldn't seem to settle down or find anything permanent, and as a result, his depression only worsened. Unhappy with his real life, he began to turn to escapism, like many of us do. He was particularly interested in anime and video games, and had been since he was young, but even more so now. He was interested in drawing himself, and often spent a good amount of time online and on his phone, frequenting forums and engaging in the nerdier side of life. However, this wasn't enough to kill the depression. By spring of 2004, he began to send emails to a former friend from school, saying concerning things like, I have no money and I want to die. Surely enough, feeling that his family had abandoned him and having been in fairly deep debt, Tomohiro attempted to take his own life in 2006 by ramming his car into a wall. He would survive, however, and after not too long, he was trying to pick up the pieces of his life once again and continue on, for better or for worse. Tomohiro registered with a temp work agency and soon came to be hired as a temp worker at an auto parts factory in Shizuoka called Kanto Auto Works. He was reasonably happy with this job, so he was shocked to hear that the company would be cutting a lot of dispatch workers' jobs pretty soon. Although his boss told him that he would be safe, he doubted this himself. After all, his confidence was near zero by this point. If anyone were to get cut, he felt it would be him. His depression hit high levels once again, this time with a good amount of shock intertwined. While he was contacting his old friend from time to time until this point, he now stopped answering all of his calls and texts entirely. One morning, Tomohiro went to his usual job at Kanto Auto Works at 6am to begin work. He was surprised to see that he couldn't find his work clothes in his locker. He flew into a rage, accusing his workmates of stealing his clothes, feeling that they were picking on him. In a fit, he ripped apart the clothes of another worker and left, going straight home. He had already felt that he was going to be fired soon enough anyway, so his co-workers felt that he worried he would be fired for sure if he couldn't find his work clothes that day. They assumed that this is what led to such an intense, out-of-character outburst. They didn't realize it wasn't going to end there. Tomohiro, no longer planning to go back to work any longer, spent the majority of his time online. He was becoming particularly active on a forum called Extreme Exchange, which you could compare to the current idea of what would be called a dark web network. On this forum, people would sometimes look for accomplices in criminal activities, to buy and sell drugs, or even to plan to end their lives together in groups. On these forums and on others, Tomohiro would often complain about his life, especially his upbringing. Not all was horrible though, he did manage to meet a woman on those forums and he was starting to feel a little uplifted as he talked to her more and more, until she ghosted him, that is. From that point on, he was even more worse off than before. If his mood was at a zero before, it was now well into the negatives. He wrote, If only I had a girlfriend, I wouldn't have quit work. I would never have become addicted to my mobile phone. Anyone with hope couldn't possibly understand how I feel. 
I don't have a single friend and I won't in the future. I'll be ignored because I'm ugly. I'm lower than trash because at least trash gets recycled. He expressed his disgust at seeing happy people, mainly young couples as well, riding. I saw a loving couple at a riverbank. I wish they were killed by being swept away by the river. More concerningly, he began to talk about recent stabbing sprees throughout the country, romanticizing them within his posts. He wrote, Oh, I am hopeless. What I want to do, commit murder. My dream, to monopolize the tabloid TV shows. Ultimately, he fell upon his final goal, writing, I want to stab people in Akihabara. Akihabara is an area of Tokyo known internationally for being a bastion of nerd culture, featuring anime, manga, figurines, arcades, and maid cafes on every corner of every block. Tomohiro knew the area well, being an otaku himself. He fancied himself as an amateur anime artist, often going to karaoke bars and picking anime theme songs to sing while he got drunk. Not only that, he knew that the area was always crowded, extremely crowded on some days. Throughout the next few days, Tomohiro would visit Akihabara again and again, scoping out the area in person. One day though, he took a trip much further out to the Fukui Prefecture. This is where he went to a military supply shop, pulling up at around 12.40pm. He wandered around the store for about 20 minutes, eventually coming to settle on buying a telescopic baton and a pair of leather gloves. The store's security cameras would catch him having a chat with the salesman, all while grinning and making stabbing motions. The next day, Tomohiro returned to Akihabara one more time to sell his computer and get some cash. He would use this money to carry out the next phase of his plan, renting a truck, an Isuzu elf to be specific. Tomohiro knew that if he rented this truck, he would be carrying out his plan the very next day. There was still time to back out, but by this point he wasn't even considering it. Tomohiro woke up at around 5am on June 8th of 2008. Shortly after, he was already hitting up some bulletin boards on his phone, writing, I will kill people in Akihabara, have a vehicle crash, and if the vehicle becomes useless, I will use a knife. His post would continue throughout the rest of the morning. 521. Sleepy. We'll drive into the crowd, and if the car becomes useless, I will use a knife. Goodbye, everyone. 534. I can't get over this headache. 535. Rain forecast. Bad. 602. I'm used to playing the role of a good man. Everybody is so easily deceived. 603. Am I incapable of having friends? By now, Tomohito had hopped into the truck that he had rented. He was all ready to set out for Akihabara one last time. Even so, his online posts continued. Somewhere deep down, he hoped that someone would come across those posts and stop him, something he admitted to later on. However, nobody did, so he pressed forward. 610. It seems the road I plan to take is blocked. After all, everything is against me. 631. The time has come. Let's go. 639. It seems I'll be battling against my headache. 649. And against rain. 650. And against time. 730. What awful rain, even though I planned everything perfectly. 747. Even though it's a smaller scale, I'll do what I decided to in the rain. Shortly after those posts at around 8.45am, Tomohito pulled up to a co-worker's house and handed him a big bag of video games and DVDs, telling him, I'm going to take this truck out to Akihabara. I'm going to stop there for a bit and then I'm flying out east. While this co-worker was confused, he accepted this action as Tomohiro being his usual weird self and didn't think much of it. Tomohiro hopped into his car and continued through traffic, still making posts online all the way. 9.48, into Kanagawa and taking a break. Things are going well at the moment. 10.53, awful traffic jam. Will I make it in time? 11.07, Shibuya, it's awful. 11.45, arrived in Akihabara. It's the day of pedestrians paradise, isn't it? Just a few minutes left now. By pedestrian's paradise, Tomohiro was referring to a certain practice where larger intersections would be closed to traffic on holidays and on Sundays in order to make shopping easier for the pedestrians. 
He chose one of these Sundays specifically, knowing that the streets would be full of people. Tomohiro pulled over and took out his phone. He erased everyone from his contacts list and deleted all text and history from his phone. Knowing what he was about to do, he didn't want to burden anyone who knew him with the after effects. At around 12.30, Tomohiro arrived in Akihabara. He pulled through one street that was open to vehicles in order to get closer to Chuodori, which was closed for pedestrians. He took a deep breath and slammed his foot onto the pedal, speeding through a red light and hitting five people walking through the street with his truck. Shoppers ran from the scene of the carnage, screaming and panicking as Tomohiro continued to attempt to mow people down as he drove. After hitting several people, he continued driving for about 70 meters further east before stopping. Several people had gathered around to attempt to care for the victims who had been hit by the truck and couldn't move themselves. This was when Tomohiro hopped down out of the truck and pulled out his knife. The first thing he did was repeatedly stab one of the men he had just run over only a few seconds prior. He then turned his gaze to the frightened people on the sidewalk, chasing them down while he screeched and roared in a complete frenzy. People began to rush into local shops, yelling at the clerks to call the police. One clerk went outside to see what was going on, only to see panicked shoppers running in all directions. When they cleared, he saw the attacker. By now, he wasn't running any longer. He was simply walking down the street in a strange, hobbling manner while carrying a knife. One police officer who was nearby arrived on scene, confronting Tomohiro. He smashed his baton down on him, but it failed to stop him. Tomohiro did drop his weapon, a 13-inch survival knife, but he continued to run. The police eventually chased him down into a narrow alley where he couldn't escape. One officer drew his gun, and this was when Tomohiro finally stopped. Around 170 meters from the truck, the police tackled him to the ground and threw him into restraints. The entire attack had only lasted two minutes. Nearby civilians took out their phones and filmed Tomohiro, his face covered in blood, being arrested and pulled away by the police while bystanders attempted to revive the victims on the ground. Tomohiro was thrown into a police van as paparazzi and pedestrians alike swarmed the car to get some good video of his face. At least 17 ambulances soon arrived on scene in order to care for the victims. Sadly, five of the victims had already died then and there. Three of them had died from injuries related to being hit by the truck, while a further four had succumbed to their stab wounds. The victims of the massacre were listed as Kazunori Fujino and his friend Takahiro Kamaguchi, both 19 years old. Katsuhiko Nakamura, 74 years old. Naoki Miyamoto, 31. Mitsuru Matsui, 33. Kazuhiro Koeba, 47. And one 21-year-old female victim named Mai Muto. Mai had actually lived long enough to place a call to the police from her phone, but she didn't survive long enough to even talk to them or leave any sort of message. In disbelief at what had just happened, people gathered around to pray for the victims and to set up a makeshift memorial to honor the victims where most of the carnage had taken place. On the night of the attack, Tomohiro's parents were shocked to see a swarm of reporters and journalists waiting outside their home. They felt they had no choice but to come outside and make a statement. Tomohiro's father, now a 49-year-old man, told the cameras, Our son's actions could never be atoned for, no matter how we apologize. His mother, now 53, collapsed on the ground outside upon hearing him speak. She was carried back inside by Tomohiro's father as the cameras rolled. Shortly after the crime, rumors began to spread like wildfire as people struggled to come to terms with what had happened. Trying to find some sort of logic in the attack, many began to say that Tomohiro was actually a member of the Yakuza, carrying out some sort of large-scale organized crime. The police were quick to inform the public that it was actually quite the opposite. He was a loner with no connection to anyone of note. A spokesman for the police said, The suspect told police that he came to Akihabara to kill people. He said he was tired of life. He said he was sick of everything. Immediately, Tomohiro was charged with attempted murder as one police officer had arrived on scene in time to see him stabbing a woman with his own eyes. He was sent to the Tokyo District Public Prosecutor's Office for questioning. Tomohiro told the police that he suffered from mental illness, shocking nobody. He blamed the origin of his mental illness on being told by his mother that he was unwanted. Police felt that this, at least partially, motivated him to carry out the attack. 
Tomohiro made it no secret that this attack was something he consciously decided to carry out and planned well in advance, telling the police, I made up my mind to carry out the stabbings two to three days ago. Even so, the prosecutor's office ordered that he undergo a psychiatric evaluation for the time being. The police were surprised to see that Tomohiro was completely cooperative during questioning, although he wasn't apologetic whatsoever. The only time he tended to show emotion was when he would be questioned about his family, causing him to break out into tears. He would then return to calmly answering any other questions shortly after. The police acquired the knife that he had used in the attacks in addition to another three knives and the extendable baton. Tomohiro plainly told the police that he had bought all of that stuff at the shop in Fukui. The police searched his apartment, finding empty boxes that had contained the knives, some receipts for them, and a club that had gone unused. By June 20th, he was once again formally arrested on suspicion of murder for the other deaths, although this was mainly a formality as he was already in police custody by this point. This attack, now dubbed the Akihabara Massacre, made headlines all over the world. It quickly became one of the most well-known and, thanks to the mobile phone age, one of the most documented crimes in Japan in recent memory. The attack had occurred exactly seven years after Mamoru Takuma's deadly attack on an elementary school in Osaka, in which he killed eight students with a knife. The Prime Minister visited the scene of the attack shortly after the massacre, expressing his fear that similar attacks would begin to occur more and more frequently. After all, this was widely dubbed as the worst mass attack in Japan since World War II. His fears came true as, only days after the attack took place, the police were arresting more and more people who expressed their interest online to commit similar attacks themselves throughout the country, usually on 2Channel or similar forums. It became more evident that this attack was related to hikikomori culture, the phenomenon in which young people were becoming more and more isolated, cutting themselves off from society, feeling alone, dejected, and abandoned. Sometimes to the point of expressing their hatred of society with violence. On the 22nd of June, a 38-year-old woman pulled out a razor blade and injured three other women at Osaka Station. On the 26th, the police had to tackle and arrest another man who pulled a knife in Akihabara. Luckily, this was before he hurt anyone. Soon after, a 19-year-old man was arrested after he made a post detailing his plan to perform a similar attack at the Tokyo Disney Resort. In the end, 23 people were arrested for attempting or expressing intent to commit these attacks, and even more were given warnings. The Japanese government expressed their intent to review their laws regarding knives in public. The Tokyo Metro Public Safety Commission also announced that they would end the 35-year-old practice of closing busy roads for pedestrians on Sundays and holidays while they reviewed safety measures. The practice wouldn't resume for years. The massacre prompted many conversations about the ethics of recording such attacks and posting them online. It was found that two people had live-streamed the attack to about 3,000 people while it was occurring. There are no saved copies of these streams, but the media wrote of them extensively. As it usually goes with these attacks, the public began to blame otaku culture, with violent anime and video games once again coming into the spotlight. The video game company, Konami, went on to cancel their launch events for Metal Gear Solid 4, Guns of the Patriots, and Tokyo, citing public safety concerns. Certain TV shows and anime at the time began to censor their depictions of knives and daggers, even highly fictionalized sci-fi weapons as well. Some depictions of knives were simply redubbed as swords instead. Access to the Extreme Exchange website, the one that Tomohiro Kato used to make most of his posts, was soon shut down as internet service providers began to work with the police to take it down. Tomohiro's trial went on for years and years, but in February of 2015, he was finally sentenced to death, a sentence usually reserved only for serial killers and spree killers. Now officially a death row inmate, Tomohiro was all set to live out the rest of his days at the Tokyo Detention Center. Tomohiro's family came to suffer as a result of his actions. In 2010, roughly two years after the massacre, his father resigned from his job and went on to live in seclusion at a new home in Aomori. He was no longer able to work, both due to his own mental state and his shame. His mother eventually broke down completely and had to be hospitalized for her intense mental health problems. With his mother becoming more and more unstable and his father completely isolating himself, they went on to divorce before too long. Tomohiro's younger brother told the media that his mother's treatment towards him and his brother was nothing short of brainwashing, but he went on to forgive her after she finally apologized for the way she had raised them. 
That would be the one and only positive thing that would come from this for the younger brother. He lost his job shortly after the attack due to his association with his brother reflecting on his company so badly. He couldn't live in the same home for too long either as the constant media swarm would never really let him be. In that same vein, he couldn't hold a job for very long either as the media would at some point show up to his workplace as well. Even so, he hadn't given up on hope entirely. He met a nice young woman and became fast friends. At first, her parents were fine with this budding friendship, but they became staunchly opposed once the two fell in love. They refused to allow the two to marry, leading to them breaking up. The younger brother, wanting nothing more than to talk to his big brother one more time, sent him over 50 letters throughout the years. Tomohiro, for reasons known only to himself, didn't respond even one time. Finally, the younger brother went online to write, Almost six years have passed since then, and I have come to realize that I am the criminal's younger brother after all. The perpetrator's family should not be happy. That is the reality. I want to live, but I have decided to give up. There is no reason to live that is better than my reason to die. No matter how hard I think about it, I can't think of any good reason. Is there anything else? If so, please let me know. In April of 2014, Tomohiro's younger brother, only 28 years old, took his own life. Tomohiro was still in prison on death row, keeping to himself, possibly having no knowledge of what happened to his family. He was mostly kept in solitude, not even being allowed to do prison work. He spent the majority of his time in his cell drawing anime and manga characters while writing stories. His artwork did manage to win him an award in the 2017 solo exhibition of Expression of Death Row Prisoners, an odd contest held throughout several prisons in the area. Tomohiro ultimately did express a bit of remorse for what he did, saying he, quote, would like to apologize to those who passed away, the injured and their families, but he also claimed that he had no memory of some parts of the attack and lead up. On the morning of the 26th of July, 2022, roughly 14 years after the attack, Tomohiro Kato was set to meet his fate. He stepped up to the gallows of the Tokyo Detention Center. Reflecting one more time on what he had done, the life faded from him once and for all as he accepted his punishment. While justice was served, it would do nothing to bring back the victims of the massacre. It would do nothing to bring back his younger brother. The attack was without merit, offering nothing to the world. In the end, Tomohiro didn't even enjoy a sense of revenge against society. He was left with nothing but regret. Now, he's nothing more than a dark stain on the history of Japan and a body in the ground. Once again, thank you for watching my video. If you found it interesting, please give it a like. It really helps me out in the algorithm, and hey, feel free to subscribe if you want to see more content like this. I feel like this is one of those cases where it really hits all the main factors that we usually come across. You've got the mental illness, you know, the toxic community, the isolation, just all of it. Not only that, but this case also involves some lost media with the live stream of the attack never having been found. If you want to, go ahead and follow me on social media because if anything were to ever happen to this channel, that would probably be the only way you'd ever hear about it. Don't forget to check out my videos in podcast form as well on Spotify, Apple, and pretty much everything else out there. I always appreciate when people subscribe to my Patreon, too. There you can get videos early, ad-free, and uncensored. Uh, link in the description. Channel memberships are up, too, and you can get the same benefits there as well. This has been your host, Kyle. Thank you, and good night.